Richard's contribution was everything. It was the amazing business of him actually playing electric guitar lead jigs and reels, which no one had ever thought of doing before, playing uh, in unison with Dave Swarbrick. As far as rock and roll was concerned, I, I thought that, that was the hardest kind of music in the world at that time. All that I did was bring folk music into it, and that was new to them. There was a musical battle going on between Swarb and, and uh, Richard, but it wasn't an egotistical battle. It was like them firing off each other, you know, I'll play that right, I'll play that right, and then we'll swing into this. Swarbrick was just breathtaking. I, I, I knew that from other bands and other times, but Richard Thompson made me listen different. I just thought, ooh, who's this? He's the guy who, who kicked folk music's ass and gave it that youth thing. Gave it a beautiful stage and colour to stand on and be seen as, as a sexy thing. You know, there you're singing a song about a transvestite highway robber. Come on, behave yourself. You know, get into the game here. Howling violins. That's the way to do it. Whereas these fatsos with the corduroy were all giving it something, something. Get out of here. You know, that was then. This is now. Boom. <laughs> People just loved it on stage to see these two guys winding each other up with who could play that uh, set of triplets faster. Well, that's the point of it, to make a bloody row. Two can always do that better than one, I reckon. Richard's one of these endless players, you know, just when just when he's gone over the cliff, there's another one. I think Swarb was very excited to be playing with the band, and uh, he liked to push the tempos up as well, um, to the point where, I mean, for me, they were almost unplayable. <laughs> kept sort of turbocharging. We got, we got carried away. Perhaps not least with a serious case of folk rock guitarist's repetitive strain injury, after one further album, Richard left Fairport Convention. I sort of imploded at a certain point. I just had a feeling that I had to get away and try some stuff out on my own. Richard's first solo LP was the curiously titled Henry the Human Fly, still beloved of devotees, not least for its cover picture. I wanted a, you know, a real, really good human fly costume. You know, the budget came down to about four pounds two and six. Henry the Human Fly is a bit of an eccentric record, but it doesn't really appeal to enough eccentrics because it only sold eight copies. Um, so there's eccentrics out there who are missing out, I think. The singing on Henry the Human Flyer is not very confident. Uh, that's the real problem, you know. Um, yeah, I really wanted to sing the songs, but um, I didn't do a good job. Having launched himself on an unsuspecting world disguised in a fly costume, Richard, perhaps wisely, teamed up with another singer. Linda Peters, a friend of the Fairports, had latterly been picking up lucrative work singing on breakfast cereal and yoghurt commercials. But together with Richard, she formed one of the defining non-mainstream acts of the 70s. It was a partnership that was always going to happen. They were always going to get together. She'd always been in love with Richard. Always, always adored him. They started singing together and it seemed to me that it was a partnership made in heaven. Linda was the front person for his words. She was a glamorous looking female singer and she became his stage presence. She could sort of almost speak for him, sing for him. Just turn up your lamp and let me in. 
Richard was quiet and interesting and sort of mysterious. You know, it's quite attractive in a young person. There was some symbiotic thing between us, if that's the word, you know, we could kind of... You know, maybe we were just the same miserable youth at the time. Just sort of worked together, I guess. It worked well. We got married. Um, you know, I wanted to get married much more than he did. I, I, you know, he always says, I always say I asked him to marry me, but then he says he, he asked me, but I'm sure I asked him. Richard and Linda reigned over those of us with any claim to an alternative philosophy of life in the drab early 1970s, blending a folk fatalism with a yearning for a better world than that of Britain in the throes of the three-day week. Island Records had trouble marketing this husband and wife duo, not least because said duo seemed rather unconcerned with their own career curve. Richard was a very uh, shy and private man at that time. Um, I, I found him quite difficult to deal with in a, in a not unpleasant way, but he certainly wasn't someone who was looking for fame and looking to grab it with both hands and squeeze it dry. Quite the opposite, he shied away from it.